Hi everyone, I'm Riley Croxford. Uh, my presentation will be on development of 3D printed uh, personalized applicator for gynecological HDI brachytherapy. And I want to thank Pedrin for being one of my supervisors. Um, so my aim and purpose, so my aim is to integrate 3D printing technology into gynecological brachytherapy, you probably guessed. Uh, what was that actually like aimed to achieve? So the reason like why I'm doing it is hopefully to minimize error in treatment due to geometry, both patient and the applicator, as well as um, into inter and intra fraction changes within uh, treatment, and then also increase the consistency, efficiency, and personalization of applicators. So gynecological cancer, what is it? It's cancer of the female reproductive system, as you can see over there. So in 2020, it is estimated that gynecological cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women, with one in 20 being diagnosed by the time they're 85. And the average life expectancy is about 83, so it's quite a common cancer. Um, there are four main types, so uterine, ovarian, cervical, and vaginal. And so those are all named because of where they occur within the reproductive system. Obviously, uterine being uterus, ovarian being ovaries, cervical, cervix. Um, and so this five-year survival rate for gynecological cancers is 70%, uh, but that can fluctuate depending on the site, stage, and occurrence. So take, uh, I believe it's stage one cervical cancer. Uh, that has a survival rate of about 92%, but then after just one recurrence, that drops to about 47%. And so just with a very small change, it, these numbers, that number is just an average. So uh, each has their own. So. Uh, so how do we treat? So there's three main ways. We have hysterectomy, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Uh, hysterectomy is when they surgically remove the uterus and you can include the ovaries, fallopian tube, and the cervix, depending on how far the tumor is spread. Chemotherapy, so it uses drugs to kill the cancer cells and is often used in combination with another treatment like radiotherapy. And so radiotherapy, thing I'm sure we all know a lot about, uh, uses radiation to kill the cancer cells and can be either be used in external beam radiotherapy or brachytherapy. So brachytherapy. Uh, brachytherapy is the use of radioisotopes. Um, specifically in gynecological cancers, we typically use um, uh, radium-192 for high dose rate and then it's called intracavity because it's being inserted into a cavity that pre-exists within the body as opposed to being surgically implanted. Um, so why? Um, so it has a couple of distinct advantages over external beam. So it has a higher conformity, as you can see hopefully in that image, so you can see that it's kept to within this area and there's no dose to the surrounding tissue. And typically, because of that, we can use a higher dose. And so it's also a little more efficient, a little quicker, less fractions, that sort of thing. Um, it also often incorporates imaging techniques. So modern brachytherapy is called image-guided, where we use ultrasound and fluoroscopy to help guide uh, where the applicators are going and to make sure we're targeting the tumors properly. So different types of applicators. So there's two sort of big types. There's tandem and cylindrical. Uh, the two you can see there are both uh, tandem types. And so they're treated, they use it to treat either cervical or uterine. And so there's the ring and ovoid. So you can see this top one is the ring because of that ring. And then this bottom one is the ovoid with those two little uh, spheres being the ovoids. Um, and then there's cylindricals. So these are commonly used for vaginal tumors. But there is some recent advancements which have allowed them to also treat cervical. So how do we perform dosimetry on these applicators and during treatment? So there was the initial method was using a point-based method. So we define points like in the Manchester system. So we define the dose at point A and point B, as well as a rectum point and a bladder point. And then that would allow us to determine the overall dose that we're using to treat. But nowadays we use uh, volume-based techniques. So we can look at the dose volume histograms and then that along with atomical information such as uh, pelvis position and organ position, we can then get a better idea of the total dose to the patient. So as maybe a couple of you forgot, I did say 3D printing at the start. So this project will be using 3D printing. And so what is 3D printing? Uh, it takes a virtual object created in the real world, often out of plastic, and it's called additive manufacturing, and it's because, well, we're adding something to make something bigger. Pretty straightforward. Um, so the common plastics used are PLA and ABS. I'm not gonna attempt to say what <laughs> ABS stands for. Um, and so in this project, we've uh, purchased the Presser Mini, I believe it's on its way. Um, the reason for it 
is it's cheap compared to many other printers. Uh, it's reliable, portal, portable, so many, it's relatively small. Um, the, it runs on open source software, so uh, it's called Presser Slicer, so it's open source, free, it's great, uh, user friendly. So some of the problems with older printers are that, say, uh, see this bed here? Um, other printers, such as the one we currently have, you have to manually level the bed every time you want to use it, which can get super annoying and fiddly. And so this automatically does that, and so it allows for a lot easier just use. And then it's fast because it's small, lightweight, quick, which is obviously very desirable in treatments. So part of this project will be printing 3D phantoms, sort of like Aster. Um, and so the following steps will be taken. So we'll take an image, such as the CD, like you see on the screen there. Oops, use that, the screen there. So create the treatment plan, um, form QA on a phantom, so a pre-existing phantom that would be uh, made and would already exist um, to either confirm or adjust, you know, see how we're going. Um, and then we can use that confirmed plan as the model for the patient, and then we can make a 3D print out of that model. And then repeat the QA on this now printed model and see how that compares to the initial treatment plan, or the now confirmed one, sorry. And so one of the things we'd have to take into account would be, um, so like you can see here, that bone section, and so, and like this would be the soft tissue. So we'd have to take into account the density when we're like printing to make sure that we're getting an accurate um, image of the actual, or an accurate, sorry, an accurate uh, phantom of the actual patient. So uh, the methodology I'll be using in this uh, project, so I'll be designing potential applicators from imaging data and then varying the dimension and source positions to try and get the best possible treatment. Um, I'll be creating set applicators using the 3D printer, checking consistency, print quality, and reproducibility, as it's not really useful if they're not good or reproducible. Um, and then testing their physical and dosimetric properties with relation to current applicators, because again, if they're not better than the current ones, why bother using them? And then with those 3D print, 3D printed phantoms. Ooh. Um, okay, so this is sort of the mind map. So you can see here, we've got the uh, design section. So we can decide between either tandem or cylindrical. And so see here, this is a cylindrical type. Um, we wanna be able to integrate with the current technologies. So one of the loaders for the high dose rate brachytherapy uh, isotopes, if it's not gonna, like if it's gonna be too loose or if it doesn't fit properly, that's not gonna be great because then that will affect the dose distribution. And then we can also use um, sort of like these channels where the um, isotope would flow. We can design where they would be inversely from the images. Um, so then we create. So we would want to use either PLA or ABS. So uh, PLA would probably be used for the majority of the project because it's a lot easier to work with as it has a lower print temperature. So it's less likely to warp. Um, I believe it's, uh, uh, well, but uh, ABS, it has a higher print temperature, but that makes it a lot more stronger, but it's a lot more difficult to work with. And so typically you want to do this when you're worrying about sort of prototyping, but then when you want to actually build it, typically ABS is the one to go with. Um, and then also efficiency. So you want to make sure, so like in this, there's no like structures to, to support this globe as it's being built. And so like how you print something can affect how quick it goes. And so that's another thing to take into account. And then testing. So we'll be making those phantoms. Um, a key thing to note is when we make those, the channels want to make sure because of the size of the printer, we probably won't be able to print out the whole phantom in one go. And so we want to make sure that there's no uh, radial elements coming from the channels as then that would allow radiation to just straight out escape, which would be bad for staff. Um, test the dosimetry, so this can be done with either film, TLDs, or uh, ionization chambers, which would have to be designed when creating the phantom. And then just physical aspects, so making sure that it's within a certain amount of accuracy, making sure there's no, um, it like accurately models the patient. Um, and so the significance would be to increase accuracy of dose distribution, uh, reduce dose to healthy tissue, uh, better adaptability and versatility in treatment, decrease total treatment time and cost, and then treat specific <coughs> patients instead of average patients. Thanks for listening. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, it's
sounds like you're just using the two materials to build the fan. How are you going to make sure those two materials match the density of whatever you're trying to match it to? So like yeah. bone, soft tissue, yeah. is there like an option on the printer or something? Yeah, so when you uh, print something, you, there's a thing called infill percentage, which is essentially how much of the volume you're filling with material. And so by varying that, you can change it to whatever density you really need. So I know um, for water, I think it's about 70% infill for ABS. So I can just do that, and then that's water, essentially. Sure. Yep. Um, when, when you, you print these things, they're going to have to you know, be inserted in the patient, so they're going to have to be sterilized. Yep. Do you know if the, the sterilization <laughs> processes might have some impact on the integrity or the properties of the... Mm -hmm. Um, there have been studies on that, specifically ABS, I know it's had a lot, and they have shown that, um, that it's like biocompatible, it can be sterilized, and it won't affect the overall print quality. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question on your yep. top of marketing yep. question. So each applicator we use it, we have to commission it. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to commission every applicator for a patient, that's going to increase the workload. Do you have hmm. any plan to reduce this workload? Hmm. Um, Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I imagine uh, a lot of like the current like printed applicators would probably be based on pre-existing models, and so maybe like in that sense that might increase <coughs> the workload. But otherwise, I'm not entirely sure. Um, sorry, I'm not entirely sure. Do you mean like, the so... The slicer works is that it yep. just cuts the thin yeah. layers and then you can tell it to fill in that layer with more density. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure it can do locally that much so, with more density. Oh, I, so like if we made like a square, we couldn't say the centre of the square is thick. Uh, I'm not sure or like a ball. I think it is. Okay. Not to disagree with you, but... I'm from memory on the Prosa Slicer uh, software, I believe you can like set up so like this section is a little denser than like the rest. Okay, and the second question is the infill is used as some structure? Um, yeah, so that had to be designed when creating these to make sure it's like uniform and like right. there is no like clumps. One very good question, how much the cost can be for this? Huh? The, uh, uh, very little because I mean it's plastic you buy these big rolls you know relatively cheaply um, the printers themselves only cost I think 300 and they'll, they can be used for a very long time so yeah